burden along, alone, I think the federal government should be looking at a collaboration. And if we're going to call it a partnership, which I would love to start calling it that, we need to have this on two fronts. The technical solutions need to be a partnership working together, and the financial solutions need to be a partnership working together. We need to shift our thinking from where the local, state, and federal officials are practicing their leadership. We need to shift that thinking to working together in, in a true sense of commonality as we address the Clean Water Act and the environmental issues and the spending priorities that are facing all of us. More particularly, we owe it to our constituents. Now, cities have um, the voters, but we also, when we serve as a utility, when it comes to the sewer side, we are serving the users of that particular sewer system. And we have a responsibility to both those groups, even though they may be uh, one and the same. In my case, they are not, because I have a regional system that touches three counties, and that includes <coughs> Douglas, Sarpy County, in Nebraska, and Pottawatomie County in Iowa because Carver Lake for some reason ended up on the west side of the Missouri River. <laughs> the partnership that we need must have a 50-50 split between the federal and the local governments on the financials, and we must have an end to the consent decrees and switch it to a permitting process. Given the current state of our economy and the high unemployment, that many jurisdictions are confronting. We need to face this affordability question uh, straight on. And if we don't, we're going to have a rebellion. And it's already started in my community 18 months ago with my 11 heavy industries. It's now creeping into 13,000 commercial users. And next it's gonna be the residentials because every time a bill goes out, we get increased complaints in my office on the hotline. We need somehow to get a grants program in place at the federal level so we can exercise this 50-50 partnership and begin to really, really address the financial issue. The, well, my, excuse me. Go ahead. The uh, consent order that we have signed is administrative. We worked hard to keep it administrative for a reason, because it gives us the flexibility to work with our state in finding enhancements. And if any of you want to see the enhancement strategies that I have put in place last January, there's a handout right here. You're welcome to take them and uh, see how, what we are, are proposing. Yesterday, we received a verbal notice from our state that we are going to get a three-year extension to the year uh, 2027 because of the uh, catastrophic nature of this Missouri River flood of last year that lasted for 104 days and caused us to expend $31 million on budgeted in order to protect our city and also Carter Lake. This is great that gives us some time here to let us work through the problems of the present uh, flood situation but get back on plan uh, as soon as we get through this. We believe that the reduced cost of our combined sewer overflow needs to be addressed through new technology and green technology. So you put those two in play, you're going to begin working toward this affordability answer. We believe that this is a very, very important step. What's more troubling that we find is that we are required to provide the safe wastewater system using models from the past at a time when we need to be using models of the future. Everyone else is, why aren't we doing it here? And a perfect example is this smartphone that is going to be out of date in another 12 months and we'll move on to something new. <laughs> we need to be doing this in what we're doing with our clean water mandates. This flexibility needs to be included with every jurisdiction and why we need to switch from consent decrees that lawyers have crafted to permitting processes that engineers are working on to find solutions together. If we don't do this, cities like Omaha are going to be faced with horrific debt. We not only will have this, this debt at the national level, but we will start seeing it at the local level, and this is not carrying our country in the right uh, direction. 
With that, I'm going to close and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and discuss this subject with you. Mr. Mayor, I just want to make a note. I was up in Philadelphia yesterday with Mayor Nutter, and uh, he is using the green technology to get credits and work with EPA, and so we, maybe you, we need to look at Philadelphia for you to consider also. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to, uh, when you, once you get the cost uh, uh, that, that, that comes to you, I'm interested uh, to, uh, how do you allocate the mandate to your citizens and also, uh, your, your business is uh, large and small, and, and uh, I mean, is there a political process for that, or do you just put something in a newspaper? Uh, how, how does that work? Well, we're no different than anyone else. By state law and federal law, when we put on the hat of the uh, sewer utility, we have to have an independent rate consultant assess our cost with capital and operating over an extended period of time, and that has to be converted back in by some type of a rational formula that's fair to the residential, to the commercial, and to the industry. We can't just pull numbers out of the air, and that's the dilemma I'm facing right now as we're trying to work with our chamber and others. They do not understand that this is a utility and must be treated as such. Thank you. And uh, next we have the Mayor Chickapee, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Michael Bissonnette, who is also the Vice Chair of our Environmental Committee. Thank you, Mr. Cochran, and good morning, everybody. Let's be clear about one thing. No one is looking to turn back the clock. What we're here today, and I think Mr. Cochran used the right word, is to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And I think to use an old Southern saying that uh, Mayor Hallandale probably knows a little bit too well, is that when you're up to your tail in alligators, it's hard to remember the objective was to drain the swamp. The good news is we've almost drained the swamp. The bad news is, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, we have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars more to get that last 5% of draining. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Chickamauga. Uh, I represent a city in the western part of the state, second largest city uh, west of 495. Uh, we have a community of about 56,000 people. Uh, your Wall Street Journal that you read today was published there. The Callaway golf balls that some of you may have lost last weekend were made there. <laughs> And uh, Westover Air Reserve Base uh, is the largest reserve base in the country. Uh, we have a long history of being part of what once famously was called uh, the best landscape sewer in America. That's the Connecticut River, which flows from northern New England down through Hamden County and into Long Island Sound. As a boy, I played baseball on a field next to the Connecticut River where we saw all kinds of things floating down that river, a lot of which was human waste, raw sewage. The river would turn a variety of colors based on the chemicals that manufacturers were back then dumping willy-nilly right directly into the river. Before I left Chickabee yesterday, I saw people in the river fishing for shad. People are boating, they're recreating. And so that's something worth celebrating. We are getting people back to the riverfronts. Uh, I often tell people that with the confluence of the Chickabee River in the Connecticut in Chickabee, Massachusetts, my community has more waterfront than most places on Cape Cod. And it's true. But at the same time, this is not 1972 anymore. And so we're asking as part of the celebration of, of the success of the Clean Water Act, the success of the EPA, that we stop, that we call a timeout, that we call for a moratorium, and take a look at where we've been, how far we've come, and what we really need, need to do to get to that last mile. Right now, under a court-ordered consent decree. The city of Chicopee has expended $125 million 
We were out to bid on our latest phased project to replace the combined sewer overflows and separate the pipes. That $125 million is going to be a debt on the backs of our ratepayers till the year 2045. The additional $75 million that's necessary to complete the projects listed in the mandate will have our ratepayers paying for those till 2075, 30 years of additional borrowing. Now, the rates to pay this all off have gone up 337% since 2003. So you wonder why mayors are facing recalls. You're wondering why there's populist uprisings. It's happening because these rates and these kinds of improvements are simply unsustainable in both the short term and the long term. We certainly need more time to implement them. We certainly need a contribution from the federal government to, to implement them. And I have to tell you, right now, uh, we're paying three times as much in debt service for borrowing as I am for the entire municipal debt. And that's with two brand new high schools, a brand new fire station, and a brand new library. We need a senior center and a new police station. But it's not some abstract group of people that are paying the sewer bills and the water bills. It's the same taxpayers that are paying for the police station and the senior center and the library and the two high schools. So we need a bit of a time out. And this is really, I think, the time for us to all be celebrating and saying, you know, look how far we've come. Kids today playing on the Connecticut River don't have to see a stream of different colors. They don't have to see raw sewage floating. What they get to see is something that they and their families and their grandkids can enjoy for generations to come. But we're putting too big a burden on the ratepayers, and we are looking for some time, some money, and some relief. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for your positive statements as well as the challenges. And finally, I'd like to call on the Conference of Mayor's Environmental Chair, Mayor Joy Cooper of Hallandale Beach, Florida. Now, Mayor Cooper, unlike the other mayors here, uh, she does not have the major CSO issue. But you would, you have other water and wastewater issues to deal with. And would you mind just uh, briefly talking about that? Sure. Th thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you all for being here and giving us the opportunity to develop some awareness and, again, celebrate the successes over the past 40 years. It's an honor to be here, uh, not only representing the U.S. Conference of Mayors Environmental Committee, but of course, my city, Hallandale <coughs> Beach, as a mayor. And as Tom said, uh, we're fortunate. We don't have a CSO issue, but we're facing many other issues in Florida. And I'm very, very proud uh, to be serving in a task force in Broward County on water issues. And of course, Florida itself has been on the forefront of many issues being one of the states that is doing one of the biggest restoration programs in the country of a national treasure, our Everglades. So we are constantly aware of water. We're by nature surrounded by it. We share water from underneath the ground in the Floridian aquifer and the aquifers below us. So we work collaboratively in Florida with our neighbors, with our state, and yes, the EPA. I'll tell you a little bit about um, Hallandale Beach. We're a mid-sized city, smaller city compared to others. We're 37,000 uh, population. Our median income is per capita $24,000 on average. We have about 20% of our residents living below poverty in our city. So when we talk about the fees and the cost of what it takes to provide services in my mind as a mayor, we focus on many priorities, <coughs> and our key priority is the health and well-being of our residents and how they are able to balance their pocketbooks. As a mayor, our priorities, of course, are the safety of our city, our police, our fire, and then the lifeblood of our community, our water sources, because they do impact not just our residents, they impact our commerce, particularly in South Florida. We want to make sure our beaches are pristine, that our fishermen are happy, and all our waters are, are kept pure. 
So with that, our city over the past 10 years has been investing in water infrastructure. One of our key concerns that we are being addressed with now is saltwater intrusion, which is by fact impacting the low-lying areas, being on a beach between Fort Lauderdale and Miami. We are looking at investing and doing studies that actually will move some of our well systems. Just last week, we've actually authored a million dollar study as a small community to see how we could place our wells further west and get our existing wells off system. With that, over the past eight years, we've invested in $15 million of infrastructure for a nano filtration plant to ensure that our water is pure. As a matter of fact, we're very, very proud. Our Florida, our ranked water was number two in the state. Number one was St. Mary, so we felt that they had some of the uh, saint on their side, so of course. Um, but we're very, very proud of our water. And again, going back, we're independent with our water and our residents and our businesses are paying for those investments out of their pocketbooks and we very very closely need to watch them this future project is going to cost upward to 10 million dollars again without direct assistance from the government without direct decisions from the state actually from everyone's pocketbook the other issues that we've been facing with are wastewater <coughs> issues and actually an issue that the state is working on collaboratively is with ocean outfalls in Broward County. The projections and partnership, we're part of a five city consortium that does our wastewater treatment. It is upward to the projections of costing those users, including Broward County, with the population of over one million people, of course, and the city of Fort Lauderdale, almost a billion dollars to address the new nutrient criteria rulemaking that we have been fighting and partnering with the state and EPA. And I'm proud of our partnership with the EPA and proud that they have worked with the state of Florida to address these issues. The DEP of Florida is currently, as we speak, working on these rules and regulations, and we have been given a timeline to address them. Our portion of it alone in the city is over $15 million, which could equate to our end utility users of up to $100 a month. I'm going to say that again. $100 a month on their water bills. As a mother of three wonderful children, I know that we need to make these changes to protect our environment. But we also have to look at the families in a city like mine where the students are 95% on free or assisted lunches. How are they going to be afforded these mandates? I'm very, very pleased that the EPA has met with us, is working with us, and as my mayors have said, they have come to the table. And I love what uh, Mayor Visnet said. We do need a timeout. We need a timeout to celebrate. We also need a timeout to address green infrastructure, gray infrastructure, and the true costs. One of the first meetings with the EPA, I looked across the table and said, we are not ABC Chemical. We are governments. We share the same goals and the objective of clean water and the same goals of protecting the same constituents' pocketbooks. So we're pleased with the partnership. We're just very, very anxious to get something. We have to balance our budget every year. I don't think one of our mayors said that, but we do. We have to run a balanced budget. We have to have accountability. We are accountable, but we also need consistency and flexibility. We can't have one more unfunded mandate in this economy to break the backs of our budget because we do have to pay for it. Our residents have to pay for it. So thank you, Tom. Thank and you. Thank you all thank for you, listening mayors. us today. Let me just also mention again that um, it, there are many cities that are not here today, but there are many cities that are going to be expressing uh, their relationship uh, on the 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act and the progress they're making with EPA. I mentioned our president, Mayor Villaragosa, I've also mentioned our vice president, uh, Mayor Nutter, and also Mayor Rollins Blake of Baltimore, uh, who is the uh, co-chair of our Water Council. In addition, Seattle, Indianapolis, St. Louis, Cleveland, Kansas City, and Baltimore uh, are cities that we must mention that are engaged uh, in a, this process as we 
is we try to understand and accept and look forward to, and that's called the integrated uh, planning policy. So with that, I'd like to open the floor up now for questions to the mayors. Uh, if you would uh, identify yourself, I would appreciate it very much <clears throat> for any questions. Yes. I'm John Hilton with Inside EPA. Um, I've heard, it seems like there's three different things that are kind of being asked for either from EPA or from Congress. On the one hand, I'm hearing you're asking for a timeout, either I, I assume is that a timeout for new regulations or a timeout for going forward with consent decrees? Some clarity on that would be good. But you're also, I hear you're asking for more grant money to comply with these rules. And then also asking Congress maybe to uh, put firm limits on what EPA can do in this realm. Are those things all together, or are they different things, or? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a world of moving parts. <laughs> but uh, there was a time when there was a national policy, as there is in Russia, as there is in Germany, as there is in Japan, as there is in Brazil, that the nation should have clean water. And therefore, the nation has decreed it should have clean water, and that's for the central government pays for it. Just as they do mass transit, highways and infrastructure. In our world, we have to fight for it. We have to fight for clean water. We have to fight for it. For it. And we fought for it in 72, and by God, we're glad we got it. We're not complaining about that. Now, it's not our fault that the Congress has decided to cut us loose and let us drift. And so we think in any uh, industrial society, there should be a national metropolitan urban policy on clean water and restore those grants that were cut from us in the Reagan revolution. We lost $23 billion uh, with the uh, Reagan administration. It was not, it's not being restored. So that is another discussion with Congress. And if you are inside EPA or with the US News and World Report or, or Fox News or anything, you, I can tell you right now, the chances of, of us getting additional grants for clean water with this Congress is doubtful as we speak. Now, this is, this is what we have, we're dealing with. In fact, we can't even get a meeting with the Speaker of the House to discuss these matters, which is another issue. So our relationship right now with Congress, while, while we have been pushing hard for a transportation bill, um, is, is challenged. So I'll, I'll just speak to that as a Washington, quote, lobbyist and a person that runs this organization. As for the other ask, I heard the mayor of Chicopee <coughs> say he would like a pause. Would you elaborate on that? I'd be glad to. Um, the, the kind of moratorium that we're talking about involves both revisioning the consent decrees that are already in place in terms of the timetables uh, for implementation. In addition, it would be a moratorium on new regulations. And I'll give you one good example. There are currently regulations that are being promulgated for nutrient removal standards uh, for fresh waters. Now, there's a lot of debate about this, uh, but we've asked our uh, engineers to take a look at what the cost to implement any of those proposals would be, regardless of which way the regulations came out. The number is $87 million for us to implement that. That's breaking the bank. Now, we do that in lieu of doing what? Uh, police, fire? I mean, there's only so much money in a community that's a middle class uh, community that has 69% of our kids get free and reduced school lunches. Um, so there's not a lot of money to go around. And, and these are the kinds of issues that, that we really want to get to that last mile with EPA clearly understanding that we want to walk that mile with them, but they've got to work with us as well. It can't just be a one-way street. And, and so I think that's, that's what the message is going to be. The integrated planning and the, the partnership, the teamwork approach is what we're looking for on everything, time, money, and regulation. Chairman Cooper? Yes, um, and thank you because um, I did get a chance and we didn't touch on integration. And I think this administration has been wonderful in removing these silos that have been set up in government in the past. And one of the key components of the pause should be looking at this integrated system. As I said, we don't have a CSO issue in Florida 
However, they're all integral, all these water issues, whether you look at Chattahoochee with the watershed issue. So to take a pause and look at some of these components universally, whether it's potable water, whether it's storm water, our stormwater infrastructure, we just saw a 60% increase in our fees just to maintain the infrastructure we require to put in. So if we really want to become integrated, you touched on all the points. I think all of them are integrated. Grants, forgive us, but we're still going to ask for them. This is a partnership and it's hard to define, you know, even the debate between point source or who's contributing what. So we look at the federal government as a partnership. Set definitely flexibility, and we're seeing it in, in Baltimore. We're seeing it. We just haven't seen those guidelines applied throughout the national government. Permits, not being under a consent degree, to me, I think that is one of the foolish policies. We're not to be in a consent decree and have us spend money on legal fees being fined. Again, going back to my comments. That's not common sense approach to government because we're fining our constituents. We need to really look at that permit issue and see how they can be applied with modern technologies, with green infrastructure. And that technology has been evolving. The Clean Water Act is 40 years old, but we're seeing a broad, open, vast frontier in how we can address green infrastructure and gray infrastructure. And if we're looking at this modeling, we need to do it through the permitting process. It can't be with a hammer, and it can't be certainly finding cities that get passed on to our utility users. So we need to look at an integrated approach, and I believe that policy needs to be firmly looked at in the EPA, and I think they're starting to listen and understand that we want to continue this partnership. We have to provide solutions and be accountable as mayors. Any other mayors want to come in on this? Well, I'd like to try something. Uh, you, you said a lot of things there, and some of those related to exactly what we're saying, and I don't think some of them were. So let's try this. EPA has focused in its entire history on consent decrees. These are legal documents. They are binding, particularly if they come through the court. They are still binding if you do something administrative. They are written by lawyers in order for the lawyers to follow through with what you're responsible to do. After that, the word shall is in your life every day. You shall comply with this consent decree. You shall follow it. You shall, shall stay on the schedule, and you shall spend your money, whether you have it or not, to get it done. Time out. We need to go back and start challenging some of the things in here in a positive way. That's why I use the word enhancement with what we're doing in Omaha. The technology is 30 years old. Where's all the new technology? Where is it? Everybody else is using new technology, whether you're in the military, agriculture, healthcare, communications, et cetera, et cetera, fuels, et cetera, et cetera. We need to do the same thing. So the consent decrees are a huge barrier to finding new technologies, green solutions, new ways of doing it to still achieve tr clean water, but go at it with a different course and a different path. We've got to get back to the permitting so that the engineers are in the front of the room working on details with local government and the lawyers are moved from the front row to the back row. We'll get more done and it will be affordable. Thank you. Mayor. Um, I'd like, I guess, to uh, comment on a couple things. First of all, integrated planning is about setting priorities. As, um, the mayor mentioned the silos are theoretically disappearing, uh, and the issue is how the various um, separate acts that the federal government has adopted, in fact, come together in ways that allow the local community to set priorities. Now, what does it mean to set a priority? Is it just a matter of scheduling? It is not. It's a matter of deciding what you're not going to do because other things that must be done are a higher priority. Um, and that, of course, gets defined by affordability as well as environmental necessity. Um, as long as, and, and this goes to why we continue to also ask for grant assistance, once the federal government stopped having skin in the game and all they were doing was taking money out of our pocket and telling us how to spend our money. 
all balance was lost. All balance was lost. So suddenly, taking out every single sanitary sewer overflow was much more important than what the water quality actually was in the river. Suddenly, it became a four separate CSO incidents if I was on a 30 million gallon a day stream or a 50 billion gallon a day stream. Same, same measurement stick. Doesn't make sense. So we have to have, at the end of the day, a revisit, call it a, um, a respite, um, where these issues can be looked at, where communities can in fact define integrated plans, and we're talking about all cities, regardless of where they are in the consent decree process. Some cities have been hammered for years. Some of us are still in the middle of negotiating, and some are still looking down the barrel of the gun. So all cities have to have the opportunity for integrated planning. We all have to have the opportunity to decide what are the priorities, and we have to have a limit in the law that says it can't be any more than 2% of median household income. Thank you. Good question? I'm, I'm Tom Curtis with the American Water Works Association, and Mayor Berger's last point was, was my question that the idea of a 2% cap on median household income in the law, is that 2%, uh, does that include all in uh, costs, drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, everything? Yes. <coughs> is that, can I ask, is that a U.S. Conference of Mayors position or is, is that a lima?